Jed Pearl is an art critic for the New York Review of Books and the New Republic. He's the author of a two-volume biography of the artist Alexander Calder, the first volume of which is out now, and we recently had a conversation about the artist's life and the impact of his work. Enjoy. I'm here with Jed Pearl, the author of a biography of Alexander Calder, The Conquest of Time. Jed, thanks so much for joining us. It's my pleasure, Duncan. Um, so your biography, uh, there's two volumes. The first volume is out now, and it covers the years 1898 to 1940. And you talk about uh, his parents, both of whom were artists. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the, the sort of myth that is spread up around what kind of artists they were and what was the reality? Everybody's always talked about Calder and his parents uh, as if Calder was this avant-garde artist, which he was, and his parents, his mother was a painter, his father was a sculptor, as if his parents were these very, very conservative artists. Um, and so the story has always been told as this kind of dramatic face-off between the young Alexander Calder, Sandy Calder, who goes off to Paris um, in the late 1920s and within a few years has become an abstract artist and sent sculpture into motion with his mobiles, Everybody's always talked about Calder in terms of a contrast between all that and his parents, uh, who were seen as conservatives and almost reactionaries. His mother uh, was a painter who focused on portraiture. His father was a public public sculptor who did was fascinated by creating large figurative works for uh, city plazas for the in front of buildings, he sculpted a figure of George Washington that's on Washington Square Arch in uh, Greenwich Village in New York. Um, so there's always been seen to be this tension between mom and dad and the kid. Uh, what I realized when I began to look more closely at the story of Calder's growing up was that although his parents look conservative from our vantage point because they never embraced abstract art. In fact, they saw themselves as modernists, as modern artists. And when they met in the late 19th century at the uh, Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts, where they were both studying and fell in love, they saw themselves as part of a new wave in art um, that was going to be bring a kind of freedom, a, uh, a looser kind of expression, a more open spirit to both painting and sculpture. So, in fact, the more you look at the story, the more connections and continuities there are between the parents and the child. Um, Calder lived as a boy uh, in, in California a lot, actually. Um, he was born in Philadelphia, uh, but when he was uh, seven or so, his father... Uh, came down with tuberculosis, and uh, the family ended up living in Southern California, uh, in Pasadena, um, where his parents were friends with a lot of people uh, involved with the arts and crafts movement. This this uh, avant-garde bohemian move in the late 19th century, which had begun in the mid 19th century in England with John Ruskin and William Morris to um, bring artists and craftspeople closer to um, the kind of immediate making of things. Um, this is a movement that influenced people in America like Frank Lloyd Wright. And Calder's parents, when he was a little boy, were very interested in encouraging his creativity. They always wanted to have a, to him to have a workshop where he could make things. He was very into making things. Um, and this was all part of this idea in the late 19th century uh, among artists and the other other creative spirits about sort of enc encouraging experimentation, uh, both among uh, mature artists, but also encouraging that kind of experimental gene in children. So Calder uh, grew up with this uh, 
sense of kind of expansiveness, uh, visual experimentation, and the more you look at the story, the more that really takes you into this incredible explosion of creativity uh, that you see in his work in the late 1920s when he first goes to Paris. Yeah, that's, that, I mean, that's what's so fascinating, is that he was basically doing, you know, there's, there's definitely, there's, there's a through line from his childhood. Um, w one of the, um, on that same note, because his parents seemed to be encouraging him to get into art, but he, they were also sort of worried about him. He was, like, he was a smart guy, but maybe he wasn't applying himself enough, so they sent him to engineering school. Did they not want him to be an artist at this point? Well, Calder was one of these kids who was, um, and I think every, we've all kind of encountered teenagers like this, he, he was incredibly bright, um, incredibly quick. He did really, really well in school. Um, there are stories both in high school and college of him sort of having the answer to difficult math problems before anybody else in the class. But at the same time, he was very casual and off the cuff about everything. And he would kind of laze around uh, in the afternoon just kind of grinning and not seemingly applying himself much to anything. And his parents, I think understandably, were afraid um, you know, that he was going to kind of flame out, that he was going to be one of these kind of incredibly bright, gifted kids who never focuses. Um, so when he was in high school, they were actually living, the family was living in San Francisco. His father was involved, uh, this is like 1915, 1916, at the Panama Pacific Exposition in San Francisco. His father was the head of the, all the sculpture projects there. And Calder was actually going to a sort of special public high school for bright kids in San Francisco, doing very well. But he seemed to have no idea what he wanted to do. His sister, who he had, he, there are two kids, his sister was a little older. She had already actually started college at Berkeley. And he would make comments like, oh, Peggy, that was his sister, seems to be having fun at college. I think I'll go to college, too. But when his parents asked him what he wanted to do in college, he just sort of shrugged and laughed and grinned. Now, he was very interested in mechanical things. He was very good at making things, making gizmos of one kind or another, um, uh, he he was living at one point in San Francisco. His parents were living across the bay in Oakland. He was living in San Francisco with a friend of the family who was an architect who was having trouble in his garden with slugs, and Calder designed this little sort of slug catcher for him. So Calder's father, not surprisingly, thought, well, maybe engineering school. Um, so he ended up going uh, to the Stevens Institute of Technology in Hoboken, New Jersey, which was uh, in those in the early 20th century, a really top-notch engineering school. At that point, the family um, had moved back to uh, the the East Coast. They were living in New York, um, uh, and he would go home uh, to Manhattan on weekends. He was still he was you know he was still in his teens. He was quite young. I think they were afraid. Uh, uh, reluctant to have him go way off to college somewhere. So everybody sort of agreed that engineering school would be a good thing. He enjoyed it. Um, but what happened while he was in school, in, in college, was my feeling is as he went through those years of college, he began to realize that he didn't really want to be an engineer, at least not the kind of engineer that the Stevens Institute was preparing guys to be. Um, what he liked was just kind of fiddling around and making things, um, right. which is then what he spent the rest of his life doing. What Stevens was focused on was really training young men to be kind of figures in industry, and indeed there are a lot of people in his class and in those classes around the years right around World War I who graduated from Stevens who ended up being, you know, vice presidents and so on at major American corporations. So while he's at Stevens, he's beginning to realize that he doesn't, that track is just not for him. Um, but he still doesn't know that he wants to be an artist. You see, I think 
that somewhere deep inside himself, Calder, maybe even from the time he was a kid, uh, knew he wanted to be an artist. But, you know, mom's an artist, dad's an artist. <laughs> I don't think right. he wanted to go into the family business, you know. He didn't think he did. Um, so th- I think that explains part of his reluctance. It also, I think, helps to explain why later in life, you know, he would sometimes talk about his parents as if, oh, they didn't really understand me. They sent me to engineering school. You know, years later, when he was already a very well-known artist, somebody said to his mother, um, Nanette Calder, the painter, somebody said to her, well, you know, so is it true that you and your husband, like, pushed him to go to engineering school? like against his will and she said are you kidding nobody could ever get sandy to do anything he didn't want to do um Mm. you know so we were just kind of trying to kind of help him find his way really yeah and at at a certain point then he decided to become an artist but he he first he went into painting and he goes to the the art students league and and he left engineering so he graduated in 1919 and okay. then there are these crazy four years where he he must have had like two three dozen or more jobs and he'll take a job in engineering and either he gets bored after a little while like weeks or months or he's fired so he either leaves it or he kind of is dumped and he kind of goes along for a few years aimlessly and um, and his parents are freaking out completely at this point, you know. Um, and then he ends up in in the Pacific Northwest in Washington State, where his sister, who's married um, a guy who she met when she was at school in in Berkeley, um, he's out there. Um, his sister's husband's family is in the lumbery business and up in the Pacific Northwest, and Cole is kind of working in a lumber camp. And then he begins to think, well, gee, maybe I want to paint. And his mother sends him paints, and then he comes back to New York, and uh, he starts at the Art Students League, which is a very progressive art school at that point in New York. His father had actually taught there. His parents are friends with all the professors, all the teachers, all the painters he studies with there. And yes, he starts out as a painter. Um, uh, His mother's art form, his mother's metier, and he then, uh, within a few years, is sort of beginning to back his way into sculpture. Um, There's this funny thing about this guy, that he, he very often doesn't um, take a straight path, you know what I mean? He sort of, hmm. at certain points, he seems to kind of slide into things or go into things sideways. Um, he called was a very funny combination of very laid back and kind of um, uh, almost and laconic. People often re, you know describe him as very kind of cheerful, easygoing, but that's combined with incredible drive and determination. So there's this kind of odd mix in the personality. Yeah, it, and at his time at the, the Art Students League, what I was going to ask is he his parents were, were worried about him, but his mom pointed him to this teacher, uh, George Lukes, who was kind of a, a wild man. What, what was that guy like? What did he do for Calder? The students thought he came into class drunk. He seemed kind of over the top. Um, And uh, he and other artists at the league, John Sloan, who was also an old friend of Calder's parents, John Sloan, very well-known painter of the American, kind of the streets of New York City and so on, had actually known Calder when he was a little boy. Luke Sloan and other teachers at the Art Students League they were very into the life of the moment, the life of the time. They painted um, with great um, immediacy and vividness the streets of New York, um, uh, the drama of America. Luke's um, 
would go off to, you know, the wilds, to lakes, and uh, paint people fishing and kind of experiencing nature um, with a very loose painterly hand. And I think one of the things Calder got from his teachers of the League was the sense of immersing yourself in the moment, immersing yourself in the the kind of sweep of time, um, the, uh, the the rush of events. And when you think about it, um, although it's um, you know seven or eight years between the time he's at the League and the time he begins to push sculpture into motion, I think there was something about the interest in, interest in the kinetic among the artists of the League that um, really propelled him toward uh, kineticism in sculpture. I mean, even the way drawing was taught at the Art Students League, you were taught to draw the figure quickly, to catch movement. Um, and again, that I think uh, really offered Calder a kind of key to what he began to do a few years later. And I'm, I'm curious, because I talked to, um, to Stephen Nafee, who did a biography on Pollock, and Pollock went to the Art Students League and studied under uh, Thomas Hart Benton. Did, did Calder ever study under him? Or I mean, there were a lot of great artists that went through that school. Did he come into contact with any of them? Benton may have been there a little later. Um, okay. Yeah, no, he did not study with Benton. I, uh, I think Benton may have appeared there a little later. Because Calder is there... Uh, which is like 1923, 24, maybe into 25, some, maybe, but basically 23, 24, I would say. Yeah, true. Sure. Yeah, and, and then in 1926, he goes to, to Paris. What, why, did, why did he go there? Was it just a typical next step, or did it represent something more? Well, every, by the time you get to 26, he's been living in, you know, he's, he's living in Greenwich Village in New York, and uh, he's become, like, by 1925-26, really part of kind of Bohemia, Greenwich Village Bohemia. And, you know, and there's almost a kind of um, uh, back and forth uh, between New York and Paris at that point. A lot of the people he knows in New York have been to Paris. They're back from Paris. They're going to uh, Paris, you know, we talk about globalism today, um, and we, we we think we live in a world that's gotten smaller, and I guess in many ways it has. But when you look at the early 20th century and even the late late 19th century, the lives of artists, these people really saw the distance between America and Europe and New York and Paris is not that far. Calder's parents had both been in Paris before they got married. When Calder's parents first got married um, in the 1890s, they went off to Paris immediately after. Calder's older sister was married and was born in Paris. In the family, she was her name was Margaret. She was always called Peggy from Paris. Um, so it was very natural for Calder to go there. Um, I think it was also a step away from his family. As long as he was in New York, um, he wasn't living with his parents all the time in New York, although he, they shared a, a apartment some of the time. But I think it was a, he, he really wanted to kind of take that next step into freedom, although his parents, interestingly enough, were, were sending him money every month when he initially went to Paris. Um, they were very, you know, contrary to some of the myths, they were incredibly uh, supportive of him and of what he was doing. Um, but it was, yeah, it was the next natural step. And interestingly enough, when he gets to Paris, he seems to sort of start, stop painting. We're not exactly sure. He's been doing some uh, sculptural things in New York before he goes, but basically his focus has been painting. And then suddenly he gets to Paris, and again, it's one of these funny moments where I think he doesn't quite know what he wants to do. And he... He's trying to figure out how to make a living. He He's trying to do some experiments. He does some experiments with, like, making mechanical toys and things. And a few years later, he actually does get an American company in the Midwest to put a few of these things into production. But he's kind of fiddling around, um, and he starts making 
little wire figures, circus figures, uh, a clown, um, a, 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 a little figure of a woman that sits on a horse and and it was kind of propelled off the horse by some mechanism and so on and so forth. And he starts making these things and um, maybe six months after he gets to Paris, he gets there in the summer of 26 and uh, uh, within, by that fall, he's living in a little hotel on the Rue de Guerre and he starts kind of doing these little circus performances um in his uh in his hotel room in Paris and uh people start coming and that's really how he begins to get known in Paris and when you talk about the circus performances you mean like um the the miniature um mechanical okay yeah um and and in paris at that time i mean there was obviously a, a ton of new art being made lots of new movements um what, what were even though it's hard to put them in any one particular slot what, what were some of the more important influences he picked up on there well um it really takes him a few years to kind of um fully kind of join in the, you know, the sort of modern wave, you might say. Um, the, and, you know, that's, that's understandable. He gets to Paris, he first he doesn't know the language. Um, some of the first people he meets are, of course, you know, sort of other, a circle of other Americans and then some English men and English women and um, uh, then within a couple of years, he uh, meets uh, Jean Miro, Jean Miro, the uh, in the, the, the later twenties, who's already like a huge figure among the Surrealists. Um, and I'd say by 1929, 1930, he's really um, part of the uh, this kind of mel alphabet soup, you might almost say, of, of movements. There are people who are working in a pure abstract way. Um, there are various kinds of surrealists. There are people doing um, all kinds of expressionist, figurative work. Um, and, uh, the, you know, there's an older figure like Brancusi doing these extraordinary uh, abstractions, which though are often derived from... Uh, figures or uh, images of animals um, and by 1929 1930 he's really a part of all this although he what he himself is doing are wire figures he started to work almost exclusively in wire um, and although he he's seeing a lot of abstract art and he's friends with people who are doing abstract painting um, he himself is still doing these figures um, and then at the very beginning of the 30s, um, uh, at one of these circus performances that he's giving, and uh, he gives them in his studio, and, you know, maybe 15 or 20 or 30 people come sometimes, the great abstract painter, one of the key figures in the invention of abstract art and the discovery of abstraction in art, Mondrian the Dutch artist who's been living for many years in Paris, comes to a circus performance. And Calder uh, goes shortly after to visit Montreal in his studio. And this is uh, really the turning point for him um, when Calder becomes an abstract artist. And, you know, Calder... I think partly because he was a guy who had two very powerful parents, and I think he spent a lot of his life trying to kind of not be under the sway of powerful father figures or whatever you want to call them. He was somebody who really wanted to be his own man. He always wanted to be. But when it came to Mondrian and his visit to Mondrian's studio, it was the one time he acknowledged the incredible importance of 
another artist. And he said years later to somebody, I think it's a wonderful way he put it, he said, um, you know, sometimes when a baby's born, they don't say any. They're quiet. They don't scream the minute they come out of the womb. And he said, you know, sometimes the doctor will give the baby a slap, and suddenly the baby yells. And it's like the slap gets the baby going. And Calder said that going to Mondrian's studio, the shock of that studio, this this bright white room with um, these paintings and with these rectangles of colored paper that Mondrian had arranged on the walls, seeing all that was the shock that made Calder realize that he realized in his heart not just in his mind, but in his heart, that he could be an abstract artist. Yeah, that's. Um, I remember you talking about that in the book. When when um, was it around this time that he started making the the mobiles, or how did that come into being? Well, first first to get interesting enough, he starts by he goes home after Mondrian's studio, um, uh, and he starts painting, doing abstract paintings. So he does that for a few months. And then um, he uh, then he starts doing abstract wire sculptures, um, very very simple with uh, you know, with the, uh, very very simplified um, uh, configurations with say a um, uh, a, 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 a circle or a couple of circles of wire uh, intersecting. And then um, he shows those. Uh, he has a very important show at the Gallery Persier um, in 1931. And those sculptures basically don't move, but a few of them move a little bit. And it is after that, in 32, that he really starts experimenting with the idea of movement. Um, and I think, you know, at first, again, there's something about him, maybe a lot of artists, maybe a lot of creative people are this way. It's not like he sees a path in front of him. It's like he sees an issue right there there in his studio, um, and he kind of is grappling with things, and one thing takes him to another thing and another thing. And he later said that sometimes he wouldn't be sure if he liked something in a sculpture in one arrangement or another. So he's left a few sculptures so that you could kind of move an element a little bit. So say something could be angled to the left or to the right. And then he said that after that he started to think about, well, if it moves a little bit, could it move more? Um and so it's in 1932, 1933, that he really begins to experiment with movement. A lot of the early, um, or really I guess you'd say all of the very early works that are called mobiles, and it's his friend um, Marcel Duchamp, who he meets right around this time, uh, who says to him, call them mobiles. A lot of the early ones are... Uh, propelled either by motors or by cranks. Um, it's actually a few years more before he gets the idea uh, that we really associate with the mobile, what you would call the wind-driven mobile. Those, you know, something the kind of thing you see in museums where it's uh, you know, work hangs from a ceiling and it's basically supposed to be propelled by air current. Um, but that idea is one that really develops over a period of a few years. Um, even when he does away with the motors and the cranks, he then has an idea for a while that maybe people should kind of give it a shove, and that's the way what will make it move. Um, and he, over the years, he'll go back to these various ideas. Um, there are even things he did in the 19... Um, 70s, where he went back to the idea of a motorized um, mobile. So it's not like he ever gives up um, or abandons anything, but the central focus moves from motors and cranks to these what you call wind-driven mobiles, but that takes a few years. And one of the things that you pointed out, kind of already mentioned, um, he doesn't really fit neatly into any of the, the major 
art movements at the time. Um, and that's partly why some art critics haven't given them the same level of attention. Um, wh why should people care about these mobiles? Why do they matter in the history of art? Well, Calder made sculpture move, okay? Um, when you think about sculpture, uh, most the, when 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 I say to you, imagine a sculpture, probably what you imagine is a sculpture of a human figure. And when you think about figure sculpture, uh, going back to Egypt, Greece, um, really what sculptors have done since time immemorial is to make the mo things that move, things that are mobi mobile, still. Okay. In other words, sculpture, through much of the history of sculpture, has been about stilling, uh, making static, capturing in a single static image something, the human figure, that is inherently kinetic. Okay. So when you think about it that way, in a sense, Calder has reversed the process and taking sculpture, which we think of as basically still, and made it move. And that is one of, among certainly the great revolutions of 20th century art. Um, uh, he wasn't the f absolutely the first person to do it. Um, there were a few artists, um, uh, uh, Nam Gabo, um, uh, Duchamp, there are a few artists who had experimented with movement in abstract sculpture before Calder, but he was the one who really embraced the idea and uh, uh, took it to heart and made it uh, this idea of kineticism uh, the core of a sculptural vision. Um, so it's an extraordinarily revolutionary act. Yeah, and you, you talk about the introduction of the the fourth dimension into his work, the introduction of time as, as a variable in the art. Uh, w was that something that he was uh, conscious of? Did he, w did he do that intentionally, or was he just this uh, exuberant guy who kept trying stuff, and that happened to be one of the, the breakthroughs, the outcomes of one of his experiments? Well, Calder... Like many artists, um, and I think you find this, for instance, when you look at Picasso as well, um, creative spirits often don't like to say too much about what they're doing um, because they feel that uh, if they've expressed something visually, visually, or if you're a musician, if you express it musically, if you're a choreographer, you've expressed it through dance, you don't want to then um, trap it in an explanation, in, in verbiage, okay? And Calder was very much uh, resistant to explaining everything, and I think he had the feeling that if you explain too much, if you got too much into your theories, you might sort of explain things away. Um, so he didn't talk about ideas about the fourth dimension um, very much, if at all. Um, but when you look at the world he was living in and moving in in Paris in the late 20s and early 30s, the whole question of dimensions beyond the three dimensions of the space we live in every day – um, this is something that lots and lots of people were talking about. Duchamp um, talked about the fourth dimension. Um, there was a Russian uh, kind of mystic uh, named Uspensky, whose books were very popular at the time, who talked not only about the fourth dimension, but about dimensions beyond the fourth dimension. There were a lot of discussions at this time about whether is the fourth dimension time or is the fourth dimension another dimension of space. So all of this stuff is very much in the air as Calder is 
pushing into this world of the mobile. Um, and I think he's very conscious of all of this. Um, but, you know, one thing that, that creative spirits do is they they kind of absorb things and then they release it in the very specific kind of language of their art. Um, so one of, really one of the challenges in, in, in writing uh, uh, the life of Calder uh, for me has been uh, trying to tease out some of these kind of influences without sort of nailing them to Calder in a way that diminishes the imaginative play of the work itself. Yeah, so when, I mean, because it's obviously, uh, yeah, I, I think it's interesting how that uh, that works for art critics because he doesn't, he doesn't necessarily verbalize that, but it's obviously all there in the art. Um, how is, is sculpture or art today uh you you've already sort of uh touched on this but how is sculpture art today changed because of Calder how can we see it changed well there was um beginning after the after world war 2 i mean this is one of the the big themes of um the second volume of my biography which will come out in a couple in the spring of 2020 and takes Calder from 1940, from the beginning of World War II, uh, to the end of his life. He died in 1976. I mean, one of the big themes of Volume Two is really the impact of his work on uh, younger generations of artists. Um, and there is a big kind of upsurge in kinetic uh, sculpture in experiments with sculpture that moves in one way or another in the starting in the mid 1950s into the 1960s and 70s and uh, a lot of those artists um, acknowledge the impact of of Calder Calder also had a big impact um, on some uh, composers and on um, uh, uh, people in the dance world I, I think one of the, uh, the the things that was so important about Calder was that he 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 suggested to a lot of people in a lot of different ways how you could move an art form beyond its kind of expected limit limits or limitations while at the same time preserving its imaginative power. Um, so, in other words, um, uh, for, for um, sculptors, uh, certainly after World War II, and then in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, it wasn't just the kinetic aspect of his sculpture, but it was also with the very large monumental obstabiles, non-kinetic works that he did after the war, um, uh, which showed that those works suggested to people like Mark de Suvero and, um, and Richard Serra, actually, who's acknowledged the de a debt to uh, Calder, suggested how you could move beyond um, the kind of singular mid-sized sculptural object to something that, say, filled uh, a plaza, took up um, you know, yards and yards of space, uh, that occupied the world in new and different ways, but still had the imaginative, imaginative power that we associate with the sculpture of Rodin or Michelangelo. I think in a lot of ways, Calder pointed... Uh, to a future where the arts would break out of old uh, limits while still preserving uh, their old kind of integrity or kind of sense of purpose. 
if that makes any sense. Oh yeah, um, he's yeah he's, he definitely comes from a certain tradition, but he's also breaking open into new possibilities. Um, and I think um, so. The second volume, uh, I was going to ask, yeah, what, so it, in terms of the latter part of his life, um, is, do you think it's fair to say that? Like I think this would apply to most artists, scientists, creative people in general. That there's the big revolutionary work comes at the beginning, or did Calder uh, go through any new sort of transformations as an artist as time went on, or did he expand and what he had started? I mean, my argument in Volume Two is that the revolution continues. Um, Calder from the 30s had been very interested in the idea of doing monumental works, works that would um, occupy space, public space, um, uh, in ways that uh, sculpture rarely had. He wanted to do things that were 10, 15, 20 feet more high. He was not able to do that in the years before World War II. Um, nobody offered him the occasions. And one of the thing that happened beginning in the late 50s was that um, post-war prosperity plus the kind of mainstreaming of a lot of avant-garde ideas, the, the beginning in the late 50s and the 60s of people in corporate and government um, positions being more open to the idea of abstract art, a lot of those developments began to mean that it was possible to do monumental abstract works. Um, and what if, you know, today we kind of go around and we'll see some big abstract work in front of a bank or in a, a public place in a park, and we think, oh, yeah, that's always been. But one of the uh, key uh, stories in Volume 2 is really the battle for abstract abstract art in public spaces. Um, this is very controversial. I actually begin volume two uh, with a prologue that looks forward to the, 19, 19, the late 1960s when Calder is commissioned in Grand Rapids, Michigan. It's a very controversial commission there, and a lot of the city's against it, to do an enormous abstract sculpture for a new downtown plaza in Grand Rapids, and there's a whole battle about this. Um, though then as the years go on, uh, the sculpture called La Grande Vitesse becomes uh, a kind of uh, kingpin of the revival of the old Grand Rapids. Um, so th there really is a whole story in Volume 2 that, that people don't know, which is the struggle for abstract art in public spaces. Um, that's why Volume 2 is called The Conquest of Space. And uh, and Calder is deeply involved in this, um, and and very excited about learning how to create things for uh, big spaces on a monumental scale. And uh, you know, he again, he's he kind of it's almost like with the mobiles, where he starts with a little bit of movement. He starts with a more uh, kind of you know a motor or mechanically driven, if you will, movement, and then kind of gets into the freer movement of the wind-driven mobiles. And so, in a way, in a parallel way, with the big public works, um, he tries things, uh, some things don't work, um, he actually gets involved with uh, these big uh, the, uh, kind of ironwork uh, manufacturing places, studios where he, he's working then with um, people who realize his ideas uh, on a very large scale. He'll bring in a, a model, say, to a couple of feet high, and then they make a mid-sized model, uh, maybe five or six feet high, then there's another model made before you get to the, uh, the, the work that's you know, maybe 10 or 15 or 20 feet high. And at every point, he's making adjustments uh, and, and, and kind of growing uh, with the work, really. So there, there really actually is a, a story in Volume 2 that I think is much more 
exciting um, and fresh than people will expect. Well, I'm looking forward to reading it. Uh, Jed Pearl, I wish you the best of luck with your second volume, and thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Doug. It's been a pleasure. Thank you to Jed Pearl, and thank you for listening to Dunk Tank. See you next time.